And this video is going to be my session zero for it. When I make session zero a video, it's because I'm a very analytical person and I want to lay out my planning and my thinking about the game. And for Arkham Horror, that's twofold. It's talking about the campaign itself, what I think makes the campaign special that I need to plan around within my characters, and also what investigators am I playing and how am I playing them. Which, to cut to the chase for who I'm playing, I've already decided on Ginny Barnes and Lily Chen, and I'll talk about the why and how when we get to them. But first, let's talk about Path to Garcosa for a little bit. I've never actually played the Return 2 before. I've only played the original Path to Garcosa, but I absolutely loved it. It's when I decided that I was entirely on board with Arkham Horror, whereas before I had just been interested, but not entirely sold on it. That said, in terms of planning for the campaign, there are no specific points in this campaign that stand out to me as this is a bottleneck because of X condition, where you need to do a specific thing to pass it. The campaign is just generally well balanced and there aren't really bottlenecks for progress like there are in the Dunwich Legacy. And again, unlike the Dunwich Legacy, not only are there not bottlenecks for progress, but there aren't really mythos cards that disable certain archetypes. In Dunwich, if you can't pass a book check, you're going to fail a scenario. And in Dunwich, if your deck is meant to cycle itself very rapidly and to draw through itself over and over again, your investigator doesn't work because of certain mythos cards. But in Carcosa, there's really nothing like that. In fact, I'd say to a fault, the scenarios really don't have any specific big challenges that you need to plan around. Sure, there are enemies or locations with clues that can be difficult, but nothing that specifically changes the way that you interact with a game. Carcosa is, in many ways, just the best generic iteration of Arkham Horror. So, there's really no specific campaign planning beyond something that is generally truer of older scenarios than newer ones, which is brain is really important. The majority of the Mythos deck in any of these scenarios is going to be testing brain if it tests anything at all. As investigators go, foot is just a worse stat than brain defensively, and this is just generally true in most of Arkham Horror, but it's definitely true in the original Carcosa, but I imagine it will remain true in the Return to Carcosa. Moving on to our investigators, and also out of Tabletop Simulator, we're going to start talking about decks. Why I picked Jenny Barnes and Louis Chen. In this campaign, Jenny Barnes is going to be my clover. Until very recently, I thought of Jenny Barnes as a kind of a terrible character. Her stat line of threes across the board is really just not very good. It takes a lot of work to do anything with that stat line reliably, and rather than being an all-rounder that works well, you really have somebody who's just below average at everything, and you wish you were just good at anything. However, the big money archetype has been pushed incredibly hard in recent expansions. They've been given the Black Fan, which is like Gios, and Leo DeLuca had a baby that only took up one hand slot. They've been given Counter Espionage and Money Talks, which are both basically Warder Protection Level 2, which is one of the best cards in the game. They allow you to counteract the Mythos deck rather strongly. And most green characters were already considering going into a big money archetype because they have bad brain stats. And Well Connected allows them to just hoard resources to not worry about the Mythos deck. And even though Ginny has better stats, it's still helpful for the same reason, it's just less important. And you'll notice when you look at my assets that I only have one of all my assets. This was originally something I was planning to do via Underworld Supports, or Underworld Contacts, I think it's called. The new card from Edge of the Earth that limits you to having one of each card in your deck. But I realized that that wasn't actually making my deck more consistent, it was making it faster. Because it would cut two easy marks, an upgraded emergency cash, and a black market. Those four cards that aren't in the deck anymore draw themselves. Black Market draws much more than itself. So you actually end up with a deck that isn't really more consistent than the original 30 card deck, and it loses some things that are really, really good by not being able to run second copies of cards like Burning the Midnight Oil, Hot Streak, and Intel Report. Oh, and speaking of cards pushing the archetype, Intel Report was an Innsmouth. It's also relatively new. So previously, I thought Jenny Barnes, and really big money as a whole, wasn't worth the investment. But with all of this new tech supporting the archetype, I think Jenny Barnes is actually one of the better characters in the game. And that's a really hot take, and it is sort of conditional on the following assumption. You have to be able to turn Green Man Medallion into experience. 
Green Man Medallion and the Sacrificial Beast are alternate character assets for Ginny Barnes. Her original ones suck and didn't do anything. Her weakness sometimes gave you a mental trauma, but really didn't matter most of the time. And her asset was basically manual dexterity that didn't draw a card. It was completely useless. And even in Fighter Jenny, wasn't very good. Not that you should ever play Fighter Jenny. Sacrificial Beast is probably more intrusive than her original weakness. If it spawns, it is a 4-3 monster. It's kind of hard to deal with in the early game, and especially early on in the campaign when your fighter's not as good at their job. And while it's in play, Ginny's only getting one resource a turn. It's kind of seriously inconvenient, especially if you get it on like turn one or two. But that's fairly unlikely. Green Man Medallion, much like her original asset, does literally nothing. It allows you to spend three resources per turn to earn 0.5 additional experience each time you do that. The limitation being you have to spend that experience all on one card. But if you look at this deck, you're going to see multiple cards costing 6, 8, 10, plenty of 3s to go around, 2, 4s. It's not hard to get 6 experience out of Green Man Medallion, even with that limitation. The real limitation is, do you think you can consistently get Green Man Medallion to have big value? And I think the answer is yes. I think Green Man Medallion is probably worth an obscene amount of experience. And it had better be, because I'm planning the stack around getting 76 experience, which is completely unreasonable and why I'm still running Sharon's Obel as well. Sharon's Obel means that if Jenny ever does lose, she's not going to take a mental trauma, she's just dead. But with well connected, meaning that I have basically unlimited ability to pass Mythos tests, and her stat line and all these stat pumps, meaning that she's going to be testing at base 5 anyway, I'm reasonably confident I'm not going to die. Especially because the first time I played Path to Carcosa, I was playing a Jenny deck that was arguably much worse than this one. In terms of the starter deck for Jenny, it looks very different. And the simple reason for that is that there's not that many cards you can put in the deck that are actually helpful. Originally, I'll be using my flex cards for Magnifying Glass and Milan Christopher just to get my book score up. It's also why I'm running Dario Element. I just desperately need to increase my book score. I'm running Fine Clothes. I'm running fine clothes, and I actually stopped and went into the edit page to be like, am I sure that's right? And I am, because in Carcosa specifically, fine clothes is actually going to be valuable in the first two scenarios. Um, however, there are a lot of cards in this deck that don't really look great. I've got some skills in here, Unexpected Courage and Cunning, and items like fine clothes that are really not big winners as far as anyone's concerned. I probably won't get a second copy of Well Connected just to make sure I have it early because this deck's draw is kind of terrible. And I probably will instead of Money Talks. They're performing very similar things. I will take a second Well Connected over that. But yeah, the deck is sort of bare bones. Looking at it, it really doesn't even look like it's a viable cluver. That's how I feel looking at it. But I've playtested this before. And it is. Against all odds, this deck with three base book does work. So I think Ginny's good enough at the start that she can eventually grow into this monster. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty confident in it. I actually think Ginny is one of the better characters in the game because she's just good enough to get by early and can easily scale into something horrifically powerful. The fact that she's weaker early in a campaign does weigh her down a lot, but I think by the end of a campaign, Jenny Barnes is one of the strongest characters you can have on a team. We'll see how right or wrong I am about that. Moving on to Lily Chen. Lily Chen is a really straightforward character. She was released in the same expansion as Cyclopean Hammer. She has base 3 and 4 in her brain and fist, and you add her head and fist together for Cyclopean Hammer. And... You have lots of ways in class, such as Holy Rosary and Brother Xavier to buff your brain, and Lily Chen gets permanent cards called Disciplines that can increase her brain and her fist. So you just get a big fuck-off hammer and you beat people to death with them. That's what Lily Chen is. That's all she is. And there's more to it than that. You can make her stronger by giving her survival knives, and you can pick up the foot dexterity um, discipline. That way you can use multiple fights at the same time as like burst damage, so you can run Brand of Cthulhu as well as your survival knife to have many ways to deal damage that can be used by your foot discipline. You can run six cents to help get clues, that seems awesome. And yeah, run some generic economy stuff under a stick to the plan, get stand togethers to draw your cards, get overpower because you need to draw your cards, get promise of power because it is broken. 
And she's not complicated at all. I don't feel the need to talk to her in much more detail than that, or about her rather. Because this is possibly the simplest character I've ever built. Like when your most confusing choice is taking Bandolier and Survival Knife as a guardian, you are standard as can be. Because it turned out that, like, there's nothing weird about Louis Chen. The only thing weird about this deck is how I plan to pay for all of this. And it's probably worth running a second emergency cash. But generally speaking, I imagine that emergency cash turn one followed by Ever Vigilant turn two with nine resources will be able to get enough of this in play. It's only a 51 experience deck, though, so if I need a second emergency cash, I can buy it. But more likely, I just wouldn't get cards like Safeguard if I felt like I couldn't afford them. Because I really don't need Safeguard, it's just a nice to have. We'll see how the economy goes when we actually playtest the deck, but I'm of the opinion that unless I just don't hit my stand together, this deck, with Emergency Cash and Ever Vigilant under stick to the plan, will have a good enough economy. We'll have to see. However, let's talk about what she starts as, because obviously she's not starting with Cyclopean Hammer, instead she's starting with a different new weapon, the Dragon Pole. This is an edge of the earth weapon that takes up both hand slots, except instead of being level 5, it's level 0. It gives you an additional arcane slot, and you get plus 1 to fist for every arcane slot you've filled, and if at least two of them are filled, you get plus 1 damage as well. This makes it pretty easy as Lily to just swing at 8 for 2 damage every action, which is insane. That's better than what Mark Harrigan is usually doing in Scenario 1. For her abilities, I've of course included six cents because I want her to be able to get clues if it turns out we have the economy and the time for that sort of thing. And then for her other cards, I ran Shriveling and Azure Flame just as redundancies as weapons, essentially. And Talisman of Protection, because it's a cheap thing I can throw in an arcane slot. Running Holy Rosary to boost my head, running Tetsuo Mori for soak and just to have somebody in the ally slot at level zero, and to help me find my dragon poles and my rosaries and my talismans, and I'm running Enchanted Blade as backup weapons. I've had emergency caches for economy. I would want a second stand together, but I literally can't run more than five cards. And as expensive as this deck is, I will actually cut one of these cards, either the prepared or the Tetsuo, for stand together. I'm going to cut a prepared for the worst for stand together and feel terrible about it, but the economy of this deck is very, very expensive. And then I'm going to take guts and overpower and promise of power because there's really good skills for my good stats. And Promise of Power is broken, you can't really justify very easily not putting it in a deck. And to fill out the last card, I have a one of Unexpected Courage. Lily Chen is very straightforward and very strong, and unlike Jenny Barnes, I have no doubt that she's going to be showcased as being preposterously strong over the course of this campaign. Anyway, that's it for now. I've been Rather Incoherent, this has been an admittedly brief Session Zero, and I'll see you tomorrow for a curtain call in Scenario 1 of Path to Carcosa. Oh, yeah, and like, comment, subscribe, and all of that other YouTube show nonsense that I'm still very bad at, but it's, I've heard, very important.